So I love to start with the why behind the what. Why did you do the Elevate Inclusion Summit today and make this a priority? Well, the inspiration, um, so, it, you know, it's a short story. I was, um, you know, I, I'm involved in so many events through Thai and uh, investment conferences that I attend. And I attended an investment conference about six years ago, uh, six months ago in Santa Monica. And they had this token invest, <laughs> investor event on diversity. And um, I kind of looked at that and I go, hmm, you know, I think, I think we could do better. And I wanted to actually reach out to the organizer uh, and say, you know, can I help you, you know, fix this for next year? And, um, and nothing happened because I got too busy. Uh, and then when the RFBIO announcement was going to be made end of July, uh, I brought on Megan McKenzie. Where's Megan? She's, she's hiding somewhere. Uh, so she was writing our press release, and before the day before it was, um, the announcement came out, she sent me an email saying, I have this great idea, and the idea was this. And she had really ripped this idea off out of my head, and she said, you know, we need to do a conference around this. this. You guys are doing this great work. You've been quietly doing this for a couple of years. We need to get people together and talk about diversity and talk about inclusion. And I said, hallelujah, let's do it. And that was eight weeks ago, and here we are. So that was really, the, you know, the inspiration was that, you know, we really need to create a conference in the Pacific Northwest that is focused on this issue. And we want to bring together people, and we want to educate people, and we want to inspire people. Because I think this is the way of the future. We're crossing a chasm right now. I think in 10 years, I hope this conversation would not happen, that this would just be the way things are. And that's the purpose of this conference. You know, we bring background and perspective and experience to definitions of words. They have a lot of nuance, even though they're black and white on a page. So I think for people to understand your definition of what inclusion is really sets the stage from here on out. What is that? Well, my definition is nobody should be left behind. Everybody should be included. You know, I was overlooked many, many years ago. And um, I'm doing that because I was overlooked. That's my definition of inclusion. Include everybody, because everybody's got the talent. Some people just need a little more help. You know, maybe they don't have access to the networks, and this is what we've been doing at Thai, is helping people who don't have access to the network and to the mentoring, and then add the capital on top of it. And you can just, just see our portfolio, and you know, these, these folks are just doing great things. And many of them, you know, couldn't raise money. And we were the first money in. We're like their friends and family. And it's very gratifying to be part of that early journey of the entrepreneurs. And many people helped me. It's not that I was completely overlooked. People stepped up, but it, it was hard. And I actually chose not to raise money early on because I knew that I couldn't because I wasn't part of the networks. So that's a very important thing for these entrepreneurs is that not only are we writing a check, but we're exposing them into these networks that they are not part of. And once they're connected, they shine, and that's the crux of it, to tell you the truth. No one is overlooking you now, yeah. particularly with <laughs> Elevate Capital. Well, and... I do get overlooked. As a matter of fact, I got overlooked last Thursday, but it's okay, you know, we have to keep fighting. So. <laughs> Honesty right there. So you founded Elevate Capital in 2016. Yes. Been quite busy yeah. in that time. $5 million in 23 startups. Yes. That is incredible. We want to hear a little bit more about how that was formed and how it's going so far. Okay, so there's a, there's a story behind it. So um, I, Rukai Adams is not here today from Meyer Memorial Trust, and Diane is not here either still. Oh, Diane's right there. Okay, so um, actually the story goes back right to you. So in 2011, we were all at uh, a, uh, an election. We were hoping that she would win. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't remember the name. Um, Eileen Brady. <laughs> Eileen Brady's uh, mayoral election, which Diane suckered me into uh, and had me write her a check, and then I got involved, like I got really involved. And so we were all in, on this boat and um, hoping for good news, but we didn't get the good news, and you were there, and my daughters were there with me. And Annika, who was about 10, uh, 10 and a half, was running around, I don't know what she was doing, but socializing, and she ran into Rakaya Adams, uh, how many of you guys know Rukaya Adams here? A few. 
Rukhaya is the chief uh, investment officer of Meyer Memorial Trust. Back then she was, um, I think she was with Standard Insurance and she had just moved to Portland uh, after a, a great career in, in New York City. Uh, she has a degree in law and an MBA from Stanford. Highly accomplished, but I, I had no idea who she was. We talked for about five minutes. I forgot about her. I guess she didn't. And um, a few years later, Diane um, uh, introduced me to Meyer. And we went in to present Thai because we were looking for some grant funding for our youth program because we always have the begging bowl out. And um, after that meeting, Rukhaya approached me and said, we know each other and your daughter introduced us. So I had to rejig my memory. I had to even ask Anika, I said, do you remember this lady with long hair? And she said, yeah, I remember her. I'm like, okay. So long story short, Rukhaya um, at an event pulled me aside and said, we need to talk. Uh, we need to talk about your next career move. And I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about because not in my, any figment of my imagination did I ever wanted to start a fund or raise money again. I had raised 20 million bucks and gotten burnt and I sworn I would never raise capital again because it's just so hard. And, and Diane would tell me, don't start a fund. You have no idea what you get into. So anyway, so she approached me and then we took a meeting and Sarah Jones is here. He was in that meeting. And it was just a, it was like an amazing, <laughs> life-changing um, event for me because they asked if I wanted to start a fund. And I just about fell off the chair because I just, that wasn't something on my, my roadmap. And I said, you know, let me think about it. And so I spent a couple months thinking about it. And uh, I know I'm, I'm taking more time telling the story, but it's very pivotal to what we're, where we are today. Um, I went back and I said, you know, if, if I would do this, um, I want to invest in women and minorities and uh, people who are not inside of the Portland metro area. People who have a hard, people who are like me who had a hard time raising money. That's what I want to do. I don't want to compete with my friends. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm partnered with uh, you know, OVF. I'm partnered with uh, Portland Seed Fund. You know, they're doing a great job. Thai Angels are doing a great job. You know, I want to take the principles of Thai of give back and combine it with investment and create wealth in these communities. And then I hope that they will give back to create wealth in other people. So that was the premise. And then the inclusive fund got announced. And then, I, you know, to me it was like, it was not a sense of entitlement, but I said, you know what? I'm gonna go for that too. And we got both funds and two black women behind it. That's the irony of this. That's the irony of it. Two strong black women. And I, and I have many, many women investors. Of course I have white dudes who are in the majority who've invested and I'm so thankful to them. But this is the story of Elevate, that there, is, there are these strong women who are investors in the fund. And I'm proud of that, really proud of that. And you're having great success so of far. Of course, <laughs> these, these investments I'm making, I am so proud of every single one of them. And Loretta talked about failure. As a matter of fact, one of our investments led by women failed quickly, but it was done in such class, in such grace, that in two weeks, she got hired by another company that we're probably going to invest in. So that's the example of failure, failing quick. We've already had that at Elevate. And we've already shown that we can help that entrepreneur to the next one. Let's talk about the success of RFPIO. Okay. Walk us through what happened and, and how that came about. Oh my God, where do I start? So uh, Ganesh and I met you know, right at the onset, actually even before Elevate got started, we met at a Thai event and I just knew in five minutes I was going to invest. And then it was a matter of time. And he was kind enough to wait till we closed our funds. And, uh, and we had intense moments. Um, I told Ganesh, you know, you know, your name means wisdom, so just keep that in mind. Um, and he did, and he really did. Um, but that company just grew like a weed. And, you know, he was a, he was, he's the, the uh, classic sales guy who is in tech. You know, that's your entrepreneur. He's the, he's the kind of entrepreneur that you want. And then the team, the, you know, all three of them were brilliant. And they built this company with very little money. So even though we raised a lot of money for him, or he raised a lot of, a lot of money for himself, he didn't spend much. And the sales just kept going. And then he said, I don't want to raise any money the next round. And we're like, I think you should. I think you should at least explore. And this was last year, around this time. 
And then he got this great offer. And it was such a big offer that I realized, and this is, this is something that angel investors or small funds should recognize, is that we have value at that seed level. You know, we're good, I'm good at just planting the seed and nurturing it up to a certain point, but I don't know if I can really help them become a tree. And there are other funds that have more expertise and capabilities and, and money and people. And in that discussion, in that moment, I realized that, you know what, my time is up uh, for RFPIO. He's gonna get us a great return. We had talked about an early exit, and he lived up to his promise, we lived up to our promise. We, we cut a deal where the entrepreneurs won, the, the angel investors won, and we cashed out, and you know, it paid off most of our funds. I mean, that was like huge. In 18 months, I don't know, one fund in this town, in 18 months paid off most of their fund as a first fund. So that was huge, and Ganesh, thank you so much, RFPIO. Because that has set the stage, because immediately after that, the Elevate investors stepped up, and they re-upped about $2 million, and we closed the $10 million fund. So all you guys who are my LPs, thank you so much for doing that, because that proves another point, that we can recirculate this wealth to keep doing this more and more, as what Loretta was talking about. By no means, I think, do we want today to discount the work that men Caucasians are doing not at all. But talk to me about, in their own right, why you think women, minorities, veterans, those that are underserved, are full of so much potential. Well, you know what's interesting, and I, I did the same thing. You know, before I raised any money, I already had a half a million dollar business, so I self-funded it. And I see that pattern repeated with all of these entrepreneurs that we've invested in. Even Ganesh, when he first came, he already had a product and had one sale. So he'd monetized already. So, um, and especially with women, they have their ducks in order when they come talk to me. And, and it's just gratifying to, to see that. And I'm not discounting the guys, I think, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not discounting the white males, by the way. I mean, I, I'm also, I'm all inclusive, by the way, because white is also a color, by the way. Um, but I am, I am uh, shamelessly, in, in my friend Sir Jones' words, we are shamelessly biased towards women and people of color. And I'm totally okay with that and saying that publicly, because that's our intention. It's our intention to give an opportunity to, to, to these folks, because they don't get the capital. And, and we are already showing that, um, you know, th that there is huge potential and possibility. Because I already had a track record with Monica. She returned us 17x in six years. I don't know of anybody else, any woman entrepreneur around that has done that. So really proud of that. You serve in the role as chairman of the Global Organization for Thai. You moved in 2014 to get the board to be 50-50 women to men. That happened within four months, which is remarkable. A lot of people would say that's an arbitrary number. Do you really need to be 50-50? Can it be 40-60? Is it the, the effort to get more women included? But you advocated so staunchly for that. Why? <laughs> Should we get into that detail? Or? <laughs> well, I, you know, to me, um, I think I, I attribute that to my mom. Um, she was just always a proponent of equal access to people and very well respected in the family. And she was like the head of the family. Um, I don't know, you know, to me, um, I just like things to be fair and balanced. And, um, and, and, you know, there were some things early on which Anita and I worked on which really uh, were issues around gender equity. So I, I felt that, you know, if I'm gonna strive for a goal, I'm not gonna go for 40-60. That's not good enough. I want 50-50. So after that event, I stood up and I said 50-50 in Thai, and suddenly we had, Board members had charter members, women charter members applying for the board position, and we had 50 50. I think it was like 48 52, but nearly equal. And we have remained 50 50 since because we have the pipeline of successful women investors and entrepreneurs in the Thai ecosystem. So it's not even a chore to invite somebody or elect somebody to be on the board, and I think it's going to remain that way. So, yeah, I'm all about 50 50. How do you think that's gone on to shape sort of the projects and the different types of initiatives that Ty has done since then with the 50 Oh my God. I mean, if you look at our youth program, uh, you know, half of the participants are girls, uh, high school students. Uh, if you look at Ty Excel, it's Carrie here in the audience. Uh, we launched that program about two years ago. Um, I mean, I think we are 
I think women are in majority in those programs, and part of it is because we are intentional. That I in Thai now is inclusive and intentional. And when you have, when you're impassioned by that, you project that out and you attract people. And so we don't have a pipeline issue at all. My biggest pipeline is women entrepreneurs from all over the country. What other strategies have you utilized in your own industries and your own careers to try to get more women? Veterans too, I think, is a huge one that's overlooked yes. as well. What have you done personally to try to include that in your own industries? Like in my, in my company, mm -hmm. First Insight? Well, so that was the other thing, is that First Insight has always had women in the company. Uh, back in 99, uh, when we were growing like crazy, we raised a lot of capital. Um, we raised about 20 million in venture capital, and I was, I was asked to hire an executive team quickly. Three out of the five C-level executives were women. My CTO was a woman in 1999. Uh, first inside, even today, half our employees are women. Some of them are here in the audience, and they've been with me for years, um, very loyal employees. Um, yeah, and, and my VP of engineering, even uh, till about four years ago, was a woman. So. I don't know, it just, it's just been with a, I don't have an explanation for it. It's just, maybe it's just the intention. But I never really thought about it that way. I've been thinking about that way the last two, three years. That, you know, you have to be intentional about it. And I have to thank Diane Freeman for that too, because that board meeting that we had in 2014. Th this lady is something, by the way. If you don't know her, get to know her right now. Um, we, we brought up this discussion about, you know, how do we engage more women uh, into Thai? And she gave a very simple answer, and, and I'm paraphrasing. She goes, well, if you're going to do something, then just do it. You know, don't talk about it. So that was it. You know, just do it. And, and it just, it's led to all of this that we're doing today, even in Elevate. It's that one conversation. It changed my perspective about how you do something. So if you don't aspire for a goal, you're not going to get there. And if you're aspiring, then take action. Don't talk about it. I think people think capitalism and they think money instantly, but there's this new term we hear a lot about, mentor capitalism, that we yeah. can all do, correct? Yes. Tell me a little bit more about that in your own career and how you're pushing forward mentor capitalism. So I had a lot of mentors, uh, a lot of great mentors that, that helped me and advised me uh, throughout my career. And really the, the idea of mentoring really f took foothold in Thai because the mission of Thai was give back our time and then eventually our, uh, our money. So mentoring is, very germane to the house of Thai. Very, very germane. We are all successful entrepreneurs. We want to give back. And so we offer great mentoring because we build successful businesses. We can give guidance. With a very little uh, advice, we can help entrepreneurs really turn the ship around. Uh, and then you add the money on top of it, it, it makes it even, even more impactful. So mentor capitalism is really just that. It's not just dumb money. It's smart money, fast money. That's mental capitalism. If there was one take to heart message that you would like all of us to walk away with today from this summit, what would you like that to be? Oh my God, be intentional, be inclusive. Um, be open uh, to people that approach you. Don't discard their idea, you know, listen to them. Uh, they might have something that you've not thought about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what successful um, venture capitalists do. That's what successful investors do. Um, I keep talking about Diane because um, she's my inspiration for venture capital. This lady spends every day she's meeting, she meets more entrepreneurs than I do and she listens to them and some of them she'll send to me saying you need to help. Globe Sherpa was one of them. So I think that's, that's what you know, if, if you're here, if you're an investor, and if you're an entrepreneur, you need to listen too. So if I'm giving you some advice, take it. Take it for what it's worth, because I've done this before. Um, we've had, many of us have had repeated experiences. So tap into it. So part of it is you have to listen. That's it. <laughs>